Hello and welcome to another edition of The Living Room, brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. Cinema. If you're watching this live on Facebook, you can join the conversation in the comments or via Twitter with the handle at Curzon Cinemas, and please use the hashtag FallingMovie. Viggo Mortensen's feature directorial debut, which he also wrote, produced, composed the plaintive score for, and stars in, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival at the start of the year, then became one of the choices of the Cannes Film Festival before garnering further acclaim at Toronto Film Festival and San Sebastian. It's a powerful family drama featuring an outstanding ensemble cast, in particular, Lance Henriksen, an actor whose prolific career includes roles in some of the most iconic US films over the course of the last 50 years. So I'm delighted to welcome both Viggo Mortensen and Lance Henriksen here today. Hello, both. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for joining us and congratulations on the film. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be there. I wish I could, uh, I could be there in person and, uh, and that the audience could all be there in person today, but this is, this is what we have to do at this time. So we'll make the most of it. Um, let's start with you, first of all, Vigo. Um, I know the film draws on elements from your own life. Could you talk a little bit on how you developed the story? Um, well, it's a story I started to write um, shortly after my mother's funeral. Uh, my mother had, uh, like the character Willis, had suffered from dementia. And, uh, but the reason I started writing the story was not so much that. It was just uh, I had been writing down in a notebook snippets of conversation that I remembered from the funeral, stories that I'd heard that were familiar but told from different points of view by different people present, some new stories from people I had not met before, you know, childhood friends of my mother's and people like that. And, um, and I thought it was interesting as I was writing them down how a memory about the same event, the same person could be so different from person to person. It made me think that memory really is, is more of a collection of feelings that evolve uh, rather than a collection of facts. Uh, nevertheless, it was an interesting thing to explore. So I, I wrote these things down so as not to forget them. And when I looked at all of that, I thought, well, these jumps in time and these uh, the subjectivity of memory, all that, I thought that, that had the makings of a good story. And so I just started writing that. And, and it quickly became a mostly fictional story about a fictional family. But I was using, you know, the feelings I had, things I remembered about my childhood and my adolescence, and also about the, you know, the the, the final years of my mother and and how dementia affected our relationship. Yeah. And had you been thinking about directing a film, or was the decision to direct driven by the story you did? No, really, the reason, to be honest, completely honest. <laughs> that this was my first movie as a director was because I finally found the money to do so, to make a movie, to direct a movie. I had tried with many scripts before, um, starting about 24, 25 years ago with a completely different screenplay. And I've tried with several stories since then. And even with Falling, as Lance knows all too well, it took a, a couple of goes before we really uh, were able to find the financing and hang on to it. Something that's common in independent filmmaking and, and something which I also understand as it relates to me, even if I'm a relatively familiar face to some people as an actor, I had given no signs other than my interest in how movies are made that I w had the ability to direct a movie. I had never directed a short or anything. So, so I understood the reticence on some, in some quarters uh, to let me have the reins of a production and um, but we did finally get it done. And fortunately, Lance stayed with it through thick and thin. And we developed a really good trusting relationship and worked a lot. Lance helped me a lot refine the screenplay and especially his character. And you and Lance have previously worked together on Ed Harris's Appaloosa. Um, could you both talk a little bit about how, how you came to be working together on the, this film? Um, on, on Falling or on Appaloosa? Yes, on Falling, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Lance, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, I remember meeting Vigo on Appaloosa, and I, the thing I liked about him the most was he had his flag from his soccer team <laughs> strung on his trailer. 
And I thought, wow, that's cool. And then in the morning, he'd get up at four in the morning and I noticed things. So he would drive up to a mesa and watch the sun come up. And I thought, that's my kind of guy. I mean, I liked him a lot. <laughs> and, so, and in the movie, uh, we were playing different kinds of characters and I, and I felt like uh, and everybody just supported each other because Ed Harris was directing it yeah. and we were, we wanted that movie to really work. And it was, a, you know, it, it was a pleasure. It really was. It, <clears throat> when, when, um, when Vigo approached me with uh, Falling, I, I thought, I read it and, and I panicked. I kind of went to bed that night dreaming about this script and, and thought, oh my God, this is like, this is like an unbelievable challenge for anybody, for anyone. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, the thought of, of, of how long it would take to do it. And, you know, everything went through my mind all at once. I, I got triggered. It was like triggered. And, and then the more Vigo did rewrites and, and things like that, and there was an avalanche of them because he was searching and searching. And, and then finally, when the moment came to do it, when he said, we're gonna go now, we can. And it was like, I was happy for him. And then I, and on the other part, I was going, oh man, I hope I don't let you down because this is, <laughs> well, you, Lance, you I, knew you, <laughs> I knew you were gonna do something special. I mean, I have to say, I hadn't written Falling when we were doing Appaloosa, obviously, but uh, that was years later. But when I had written it and I hadn't had you or anybody else in mind for the part or any part in the story, but as soon as I had the script finished, I thought Lance Henriksen would be wonderful in this role. Having met you in Appaloosa, I knew that you were generous and kind and you had a great sense of humor, you were a good storyteller and so forth. But the roles I'd seen you play, you had a really strong presence, you know, intimidating presence even, and this voice, the stature, everything. I, I just thought, and, and more than that, <clears throat> all the things I'd seen you do, which is not everything because you've done I don't know how many hundreds to over 270 movies, I think. Uh, I don't even know if you've seen them all, have you? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but no. everything I have seen, and I saw a lot, and then I started to see lots more as we started working together. I found them and watched them all. You're always honest. You're always completely committed. And no matter how out there the story might be and how short a time you're in these stories, you're always believable. You're always, I don't know how, what you're doing exactly, but I could see that your work, just like it was in Appaloosa, was committed and you were just not going to be caught acting. You were, it was for real what you were doing, no matter what the story. It, is quite and, here. it really was. I, I didn't want to get, I didn't want to risk getting caught acting because I felt like it, it would be such a betrayal to an audience. I mean, it really would be. And, and so, the commitment was, here we go. I mean, really. And it was a great adventure. It really was. It was something. And also when I got to know, as I was getting to know Lance, you know, in a couple of years, and we had to be patient because I couldn't find the money and couldn't or couldn't find enough. Then when we found it, we lost it and tried again and again. We used that time to get to know each other, not just to work on the script, but to get to know each other. And then, you know, telling each other things about our, our own lives. And, um, and I started to get this, this uh, a picture of what Lance's childhood was like. And it wasn't a pretty picture, <laughs> to be honest. It was tough. It was a tough childhood. I mean, really. Uh, some horrible events that you described to me, but you described it in a very calm voice. Sometimes you even laughed at some of the things, which I said to you, I thought that's remarkable that you're not bitter about it, that you're not angry. And you said, well, it took me a long time to get past it. And uh, I don't wanna, I mean, I've already been through that. I don't wanna dwell on that. I wanna move on. And that's, you've obviously found a way to do that. And then I understood why, because when I came to Lance after we'd lost the money a couple of times, then I finally said, we're going to do it. When I called him, I said, are you still, you still want to play the part? And he said, uh, 
yes. And I said, what's that pause? And he said, you don't have to do it. I mean, you know, I only want you to do it if you really want to do it, because I know it's a difficult part. And you said, yes, it is a very difficult part. But more than that, I'm going to have to go to some places in order to be as honest as I can. I'm going to have to dig up some old memories that have to do with my childhood. And after getting to know him, I realized what he meant, you know. Um, and I thought, and I think that just, just watching him perform as we were shooting and then seeing it in the editing, I mean, it's such a complex and layered performance and a brave performance because of the places he went emotionally and, and in, a, in a very honest, you know, fearless way, so. Lance, it's an extension of what Viga was just saying, and, and I have seen you in so many different films, and, and you've definitely successfully created a huge long line of characters who are total bastards in films. But <laughs> what's, what's fascinating with, with Willis, his behavior here shifts from a torrent of abuse through to a sense of helpless, helplessness, but also these incredible moments of calm. Not just the emotional um, challenge, of, but it, it strikes me the physical challenge of actually maintaining those heightened levels of emotion must have been quite a tough one over the course of a shoot. No, that, that, that wasn't an issue with me. I, I think once I knew that this is my family, that these characters in this movie are, are inextricable, inextricably bound to me, that I used them, I used their, their reactions to things. And, and we, once the train left the station, there's no stopping it. And, and what I felt was that I could trust everybody that I was working with, that they would accept the the chore that we had ahead of us and it really was a chore there wasn't it there are some wonderful moments in it you know and, and it all has to do with connecting to the people that are your family and in whatever way it happens to fall you have to be you have to do it you have to be there for it you know and willis is not an easy guy you know he and I, I accepted that, I, I understood it. But, but it wasn't an easy movie, but it was the most rewarding movie I've ever done. Mm. Yeah. There's um, a scene that obviously everyone, whenever they watch a film, finds their own way into the emotional element of the film. And, and it surprised me how quickly it happened for me with this film, the, where you're on the plane and you go into the toilet. And there's just one brief moment where you turn around and you face yourself in the mirror and the look of shock on your face as, as though you don't recognize the person in the mirror, I find incredibly painful to watch. Mm -hmm. And I, you, because you get this sense, unlike other films I've seen that deal with dementia, you don't necessarily completely immerse, get immersed into the inner life of that person. And that moment, I, I suddenly saw an aspect of you on the inside. And I was just wondering these nuances that appear throughout the film, is this something that was originally in the screenplay or was it something that was developed in conversations between the two of you as you were filming? No, the, well, script, the, script, yeah. had, the script had these things. And, and yeah, <laughs> I know. now that you're bringing it up, it's really hard to revisit some of this stuff, yeah. but it, it, it's as if, um, I had permission. Vigo gave me permission. And, and that was the pleasure of it all because it's storytelling. It's, it's, it has its own reality. It's not the reality of life. It's the reality of telling that story. And it's, it was a great challenge and a great pleasure to do it. I, I know I'd go to bed exhausted every night, you know, and wonder, if I'm going to get up at call time, but I did. I did. <laughs> you always did, though. You always did. After, as far as the dementia aspect, you know, it is something that not just my mother that, that I've experienced close up and very intimately, and sometimes in a caregiving role. Both my mother and my father, three of my four grandparents, aunts, uncles, my stepfather, and with my mother and father, and my stepfather in particular, but especially my mother and father. I uh, had, I saw it up close and in a consistent manner. Um, 
And one thing that I've noticed, you know, you pointed this out, but the depictions of dementia aren't always quite the way we we uh, try to do it. Uh, what what I find in even the best movies or plays uh, that we've seen, and Lance have seen some of those with me together, is that they are usually showing someone who's confused. And if they do try in some way to show the point of view of the person uh, who has dementia, they're also showing a confused person. And my experience is that normally the ones who are confused are the observers of that person. That person is seeing, hearing, feeling happily, sadly, however they are, for real, those things in that moment. That is their presence. You know, and if we say that memory is subjective for all of us, why is their perception any less valid than, than ours? And you know, the only time they get truly confused, I find, is if you try to correct them. You know, if they're talking about someone that, that they've just had lunch with or something that that you know has been dead 30 or 40 years. If you say that to them, then of course that person dies for them again and they are confused and upset and everything. And you have to ask yourself, and this is part of the caregiving role, what good are you doing then? Isn't it more for yourself? Because you want that person to be the way they were. You're correcting them, not to help them because you're not helping them, as it turns out. This is something you learn when you're exposed to the, to the disease. These are some of the things that happen. But in any case, what we wanted to show is not a person who was confused, but a person whose present was different. And of course, film has so many tools and you, there's no end to the ways that you can describe things and show things using images, sound, sometimes only sound, sometimes depending on where it's placed, what the quality of it is, what the types of images are. And we could have gone a long way to getting done what we did, but we would have never gone as far as we did if we didn't have Lance portraying this character, because as you rightly point out, and nobody else has mentioned that scene in the, in the lavatory and on the plane, but there are so many moments, and I got to see it from the best seat in the house, you know, because I was acting with him in most of those moments, or, or many of them. Um, the way that you listen, Lance, the way that you react and the way you go in and out of mental states in a very subtle, complicated to do. It looks so real and so natural that unless you're an actor, really, you know, someone who's experienced in acting or directing or, you know, movie storytelling, you might not appreciate just how difficult it is to pull off what Lance does. So he took that, all the tools we had, plus Lance's performance, allowed us to, I think, create a, a, a fairly more accurate than I'm used to seeing depiction of, of dementia. I, when, when I, the things that I've seen where dementia is portrayed, it always seemed like a, that there was a, uh, a, a stop sign. It was more like a, 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 a neutralizing of, of, of life at that moment, rather than it just, it didn't have any context to me when I saw it. And I wondered why, and I wondered what, what happened that, that they decide to put somebody in such a deep fog. Uh, and and I, I realized that people, people have a reason for living and as don't fix me, especially in our film, it's, don't try to fix me because there's nothing wrong with me. And it was an active thing rather than submitting to, I am, I am confused and I can't pull myself out of it. That's a different thing. It's a whole different world. And uh, there must be many kinds of dementia too, based yeah. on the life of a person. And stages, of, and stages of it, of course, yeah. Right. You're at, then, your character is at the beginning of it, but yeah. Right. And, and, and sorry, I, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't, you know, I'm not a doctor as an actor. I, I, I just was taking one scene at a time and, and trying to find out where I was at in relation to everybody. You know, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, I would not get caught acting. That's, that was the most important part. I, I, if I didn't, if I didn't uh, connect with what we, what, 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 what was going transpiring between the characters, I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, yeah. I really wouldn't know what to do, but I would not be in a fog of, of uh, uh, 
bowing out. Mm. It was the opposite. And, and Vigo, Vigo's support for how we did scenes and, and how, how many times we did them or was so great. I mean, it was, it's probably the high point of my life in a way, this, this movie, because I also was able to forgive all the abuse of my childhood. And by doing this, uh, it was the very reason I got into acting in the first place was I wanted to uh, educate myself and, and to feel the better feelings, the kindness and the, and, and the world around me as a safe place, as opposed to what I went through. So right. I, I yeah. achieved very happy. We've um, we've got we've got quite a lot of questions coming in from audience members, so I'll, I'll turn to those now. Um, this is from Troy Foreman. Uh, Lance, um, he, he asked about the emotional scenes that you you have in the films, and how do you mentally prepare yourself for those scenes? Surrender. That's how. That's how. I mean, I have a history. I only went to three years of grammar school. I never went to school. And, I, and my family were mar marrying and remarrying and uncles were drug addicts. And I, the, I had the whole history of, of a, of a, of a di dysfunctional family. And so I, I got tough as a kid because I was stuffing it all away until I got old enough or smart enough to, uh, to let it all go because you can't hang on to that. It's a, it's a no win memory, you know? So in so many ways, uh, acting brought me down the road of some kind of sanity, a PTSD mm -hmm. that you can live with and surrender it and get on with your life because it's a short one anyway. Yeah. I, mean, I hit 80, I can't even believe that. <laughs> but I Upstairs. The other, the other thing that's fascinating about your performance and and the way that the film deals with it, and again, it's looking at other films, it's almost as though that person's personality becomes the disease in some of the dramas I've seen. Whereas I know people who have had to deal with someone in their family who has had dementia, and one person said to me, "It's like another dimension of their personality. It's another facet, a side of their personality that does eventually take over," but. It's not the that's not the only element of their personality, and that's something I got with this film and your performance, is that there's so much, other, so many other things in your life and your way of behaving, and this is just another unfortunate element that's come into your life. Right. It's very true. Um, and feeding into that, uh, Vigo, is the scenes from the past. I'm not going to call them flashbacks because it's interesting. You keep saying memory; D they feel more like memories than a flashback in the conventional cinematic sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the intention was to show <clears throat> memories that were sometimes clearly originating in one, from one person, coming from one person or within a person. Uh, sometimes it would be Willis, sometimes it would be John, occasionally Sarah, my sister, played by Laura Linney, who's brilliant in the movie as well, as you've seen. Um, and sometimes they had a more of a, they were shared memories or semi-objective, not that there is such a thing as an objective memory, but um, in this context, maybe you could describe them that way. And I knew what we, what I wanted to do in terms of image and sound. And so I used, that was part of the, what we did when we didn't have the money. At one point, I just got fed up and that's when I called Lance. I said, we're gonna go ahead and do it. We're gonna start. What I, I didn't tell Lance that we didn't really have the money to shoot the movie. Uh, I just said we're starting, um, and which meant that I went to the locations to find them with Marcel Ziskin, our cinematographer, and Carol Spear, our production designer. I said, okay, let's find this place. And we can't, we won't be able to afford time wise and money wise to do what you normally would do in such a movie is find the exterior of a farm, the interior somewhere else. Uh, or a studio, which we couldn't afford. Um, the barn would be somewhere else, the fields would be, no, we have to find one farm. So it took some time, but we did find it. And then what I wanted to do was to film in spring, summer and autumn, which we did, repeated trips. 
And I wanted to have a library of images that I knew, in some cases, I knew exactly what I wanted once I saw the place. And Marcel and, and I started shooting those because we would use them in specific places. But we also shot a lot more, you know, where we then at that point, we had some freedom and some time. So it's, we would be driving down the road and we'd just stop and say, look at that. We'd just get out and film. Or we'd be walking around the farm and we'd see things, insects, birds, uh, animals, plants, trees, you know, things that we thought would be evocative of where Willis's mind would go and where John's mind would go. Um, and then memories that we would place Gwen in, you know, and, and then in terms of sound, the same thing, work building up a library of sounds. And, you know, Gwen, the role that Hannah Gross plays, since the story was, you know, it was about my mother and, and initially, that was the inspiration. That was a really important role for me to find the right person, which we did, fortunately. <coughs> and um, to me, even though the story is about Lance's character and my character primarily, the reason for their, a lot of their differences and their conflicts is how they remember it often is how they remember her. They're differing feelings about her. It's also about how Sarah remembers her mother. And, you know, and she's sort of a bone of contention beyond the ideological differences we have and, you know, generational differences. She's always there, you know, so that was very important. And, and we use her voice, you know, Lan you, Willis, Lance's character, often is the only one that is seeing her and hearing her. That's where he's at. That's where those are the places he goes often. And I don't know that, but I also go there, you know? Uh, and it has nothing to do with dementia. It has to do, as you say, with memory. Um, I have a question from Mary from London. Congratulations to both of you. I think it's a stunning film. Um, also, Laura Linney um, is, is excellent. And that scene I found overwhelming. Could, could you please talk about that, that lunch scene, both of you? Um, well, that was probably our longest scene um, and most complex to, to set up. And I knew I wanted to try something different because it's the one scene where Lance is, where Willis is with not just one or two people, but there's a lot of people and there are a lot of sounds. And we did a very careful sound mix. You know, it's Los Angeles. So even though it's sort of an idyllic backyard, there's constant police sirens and airplanes and lawnmowers. And there's a lot of things for Willis to keep track of there. And a lot of people talking at once and saying things and referring to things that he might, he's just trying to keep up in some cases. And then he just sometimes just doesn't want to even pay attention. He's going to wherever he's going. And so, you know, we didn't have much time to shoot that. So that's the one scene where we all rehearsed. We did sort of solid rehearsing as if we were rehearsing for a play in a way so that everybody was comfortable with their cues. And also, so Marcel and I understood what we wanted to do with the camera because that's, there's a sort of an ambitious attempt there to get in Lance's head visually in the present, not through memories of the past, but how the camera moves. The movement of the camera reflects his mental state to some degree or how his attention is being pulled in so many directions and, and then suddenly when he gets fed up and says stop basically the camera stops I mean it's not so obvious it's subtle but it, it does stop and then things start to get out of hand again for him and the camera starts to move again and then eventually it does stop as more and more people leave the table and then it becomes something else entirely so that whole section feels to me, it's almost like a play in a way, but using the tools of, of movie making. Uh, I was very happy with that and the actors and the way everybody interacted. It was, it was, a, it was a lot of work for all of us, that scene, but it was, it was worthwhile and it was fun. We had fun doing it, didn't we, Lance? I mean, it was a it was oh, nice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, were, there were some very awkward moments, but there was a lot of fun. I mean, hi. I loved uh, ragging on my my relatives. I mean, yeah. because they, they came looking like something out of Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. One of them had blue hair and the other one had a rivet in her nose. And I'm going, what is happening? 
<laughs> Can you even eat with that thing in your nose? <laughs> it's like, it went on and on, you know. I mean, but there, there, there was some joy in shooting this movie. I mean, when you see actors just thrive and, and come alive, and it, it's just beautiful. I mean, it really is. That's the subtext. I mean, it's not. You know, it's not what was going on. I mean, there were a lot of highlights when we went to the sea and we had to do that somehow. And we just sort of just did it. We were like, well, well how are you going to do it? You need all these. No, we'll just do it. We'll just go in the water, <laughs> you know, eventually. It is the sun. We got to go, guys. It's the sun is going. And, and so it's Marcel with a garbage bag under the camera. So to oh, yeah. not I mean, it's, get it wet. We were and, and I had him in a bear hug, you know, so that he wouldn't be knocked over by the waves. I was holding him. Washed away um, by the... Yeah, right. And then I had several cigarettes burning in my mouth because they would get wet and Lance would have to go again. So I'd hand him one and then we'd keep going. And we did all... We did go down. You fell down. Uh, yeah, I, my favorite line that... that so did we, but we managed to keep the camera up. Yeah. There's a constant thing. Yeah, have you got one more in you? That's what I said. Did I and say I, that to you a lot? Yeah, it's a challenge. You got one more? Can you lay in the ice a little longer? Can you? Can you? Can we walk back out into the ocean? I mean, can you, and and every time you said it was a challenge, so I said <laughs> yeah, I definitely have. I have another one. <laughs> well, you're a trooper, man. Well, at least you were on the west coast. I mean, if you were shooting this in England at this moment in time, I would definitely say don't go anywhere yeah. near the water. Although it was winter, so you didn't notice too many people uh, yeah, it's true. swimming with him that evening. <laughs> Nobody. No, but people were on the no, beach. It was better. Yeah. It was better than being in England right now swimming, I'm sure. Um, we've got time for just uh, two more questions. Uh, Lance, this one's from uh, James from Liverpool. Um, I thought you were brilliant in the film. I've never seen you better. I don't want to put you in an awkward position with Vigo by asking you what's your favorite role, but across your whole career, what do you think was the craziest role that you took on? This one. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, Vigo knew it. He knew it. He knew what he was doing. I, and he hired me. So this has been the one. This is, this is something. I, after I saw the movie, I remember my agent was sitting down below me in the theater, seeing it for the first time, and he was crying at the end of the movie. And I, I my mind even went to a joke at that moment. I said, agents don't cry. <laughs> what's, what's going on? I mean, it was like, it was, anyway, look, man, I, we, we worked hard and, and and now, because we're doing Zooms, we're reliving it, and it's kind of amazing. I, I guarantee you I'm not digital. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I've got a question from Emma Perugia. Um, Vigo, has this experience changed your feelings about directing, especially releasing your film in such an unusual oh. time? And do you plan to direct any more films? I definitely do. and. As Lance knows, and as Lance is also this way, I'm very stubborn. Otherwise, we, <laughs> I'm, I'm determined. And, you know, yes, it's been a challenging year and frustrating. As you pointed out, we were invited, which was incredible to all of us and, and wonderful to be in the Cannes Film Festival, official selection and all these other honors and opportunities we've had. But some of these festivals haven't been celebrated and it's had to be digital or some other way. And it, it's been frustrating for any anybody who has a movie ready to come out this year, but you just stick with it and you just hope, you know, you have a moment, you're in a lockdown where you think it'll never be seen in cinemas by anybody. That's a shame, but it is going to be, which is wonderful. In short, <clears throat> it was as difficult, every bit as difficult as I thought it would be um, not that I had feared, I didn't fear it. I just knew this is going to be a lot of work, just like Lance knew it was going to be a lot of work. But it was even more rewarding and satisfying than I had, than I dreamed it might be, you know? Um, so I definitely, as soon as I possibly can, and I have some, I have some other stories. I've written two more during, since the pandemic started. 
one of those last two looks likely to be the next one. I'm not sure which. I have producers interested in both, fortunately, so maybe it won't take me 24 years this time. I don't really have that <laughs> enough years to wait 24 years for each movie. So I hope it'll be in, in the next year or two at the most. And I look forward to it. Um, and as Vigo said, Falling um, is, is available to watch online on Chosen Home Cinema, but cinemas in certain areas of the country will be opening next Friday and this film will be screening in cinemas. And I will definitely be there watching it for the first time on the big screen after watching it twice online. Um, thanks to Modern Films who are releasing this film, but most of all, thank you for joining us today, Vigo and Lance. Thank oh, you. You're welcome, man. Thank you for having and congratulations us. Congratulations again with the film. Thank you. And good luck. Be careful, everybody out there. And, you know, take care of yourselves and take care of, of those around you. I think by now we all know how to at least try to do that. We have enough information. So let's try to do it. I'd say it in part, not just out of empathy and affection for you, but also out of selfish motives. I want people to be able to walk around and go to the movies and see movies like ours. So take care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs>